Hi, everyone. We're just chatting for a minute before the um, real event starts. Um, we're just hanging out, uh, waiting for seven o'clock to roll around. Um, but I'm Rachel Mead, just to say that briefly before, before I get introduced. Um, and I'm the Public Engagement and Interpretation Coordinator at the MAP Center. And tonight we'll be talking about Upham's Corner. I'm really happy to be doing that. Very excited. <laughs> See, Rachel, you just said my entire spiel. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, because nobody's here yet. Um, but people, well, there are five people here. But there will be people here um, in a minute when we actually start. And then, and so I, I haven't, I've only scooped you for the people who watch later. <laughs> um, it's really, really, really short. <laughs> it's not hard to scoop. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So after this one, what's the next one of this coming up? Is it Fields Corner? Yeah, we're doing Fields Corner um, a week from today, which should be interesting um, to do on November 4th. We'll see how everyone's feeling on November 4th, but it'll. I know. I felt bad about doing it three days before Halloween. <laughs> I know. Yeah. yeah. Luckily, um, hopefully Halloween will be good. Uh, whatever whatever we have to say, Halloween will will come whether or not we <laughs> have a good program. <laughs> That's so completely true. <laughs> Although we'll see. Are you, are you doing anything for Halloween this year? I heard trick-or-treating is canceled in a lot of places. I'm hiding from it. I'm kind of terrified about what it's going to do to COVID spiking. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Well, no parties for us. All right. So it's one minute after seven, according to my computer. Is that correct? Yeah. So let's uh, let's hit it off. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Georgia Titonis. I'm the branch librarian at the Appleham's Corner branch of the Boston Public Library. As you guys who have all been in the library, although not recently, um, can tell I'm not currently there. We have not made it back to evening hours yet. But that does mean that we can do evening programs on days that are not Thursday. So it's a plus. <laughs> um, today, I'd like to introduce um, Rachel Mead, who is the Programs Engagement and Interpretation Coordinator for the Leventhal Map Center. And she is going to take us through some maps and some history of the Upham's Corner neighborhood. It's up to you, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you. I'll say goodbye to you for the moment. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna be talking a bit about Upham's Corner. Let me, how do I make that big? Oh, there we go. Um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about Upham's Corner tonight. Um, hopefully you learned some things that you didn't know about before. Um, and this is really all about the urban atlases project that we've been working on at the MAP Center, which um, has resulted in a really cool tool um, that I think everyone will be super interested in learning about called Atlas Scope. So um, before we get super into that, um, I want to give a brief um, mention of, of something that's definitely related. Um, I want to acknowledge before we begin that we work on, live in, and are discussing land that was unjustly taken from Native people. Uh, what European settlers called the Shaman Peninsula was called Mashawomuk by Algonquin speakers, and it was and is home to groups including the Mashpee and Aquinawampanog tribes, the Nipmuc nations, and Mashpee and Aquinawampanog, or sorry, and descendants of the Massachusetts people. Today we're talking about land that we now call Upham's Corner. Uh, based on the name of a white property owning man who ran a business in the area in the early 19th century. The urban atlases we are about to discuss record property ownership in the 19th and 20th centuries, but they do not adequately address previous or contemporary Native groups. Often, the late 19th and early 20th century period is thought of as a time long after colonization in New England, but colonialism is an ongoing process both in the time these maps were created and today. These atlases were being produced during the same period that settler governments were prosecuting massive, violent efforts at native land dispossession in other parts of the continent. 
Today, nations and bands are still asking for recognition and land rights from federal, state, and local governments. The land we're standing on today, much like the land that's documented in these atlases, cannot be understood without acknowledging the expropriation and genocide which took place during colonization. Many of the maps we have at the Leventhal Map Center were created for this project of colonialism, expansion, erasure, and dispossession. These urban atlases certainly represent the erasure portion of that. However, Native people remain on this territory, carrying on the traditions of many generations. If you're tuning in from out of town, um, or if you've never taken a look at it, I recommend going to this website that I have um, at the bottom of the screen, native-land.ca. Uh, it's an excellent digital mapping project. Um, it can help you start develop or start or develop your thinking about um, the ways cartographies of colonization relate to your life and where you live. This land acknowledgement is really just an acknowledgement, but hopefully it becomes a seed for change in the ways that we interact both with land and the legacy of settler colonialism. So if you'd like, you should go to this website, leave a note about whose land you're on in the comments, we're gonna be looking at the comments throughout the night um, and I want this to be interactive. So if you have questions or comments related to this or something else, um, just let me know and I'll try to address it. So um, here's what the map looks like um, kind of writ large. It's got indigenous groups from all over um, the Americas, Australia and some in uh, Europe as well. So I wanna talk a little bit about what urban atlases are. Um, I mentioned them in that uh, land acknowledgement, but to be more precise, they are these property maps. Um, they're these huge books and they've got really intricate information about um, land and about the, um, the property ownership status of buildings and pieces of property. So, um, this is a key from one of them, a Sanborn uh, Fire Insurance Atlas from 1875. You can see that it tells you what um, materials the buildings are made out of, um, whether it's a stable, if it's got windows and what kind of shutters are on the window, um, where the window openings are, like what stories they're on. Um, all of this information is like really important if you are um, trying to decide how much to insure a property for but they're also really useful to us today. Um, and another thing that people are, are very obviously interested in today is the um, this part right here, which is the part where it just tells you whose property it is, um, which is really useful if you're doing any kind of historical research, especially like genealogical research or something else like that. So like I said, these are really huge books um they are like two feet by three feet closed um which means that if you want to look up a place in one of these books you have to flip to the index um just like any other atlas you have to um, find the page that you're supposed to go to if it's a really long street that you're looking at it could be on multiple pages you flip to that page and then if you think oh this is what it looks like in 1898 what happened in 1904 you have to go get another book and also find space for that on your table, which is very cumbersome. Um, and even though these are like really beautiful, um, they're very difficult to use in some ways, especially for comparing land use over time. Um, but they're super, super helpful. So you can find out the history of your house, the history of the place where you live, um, you can figure out like what the city looked like, what the landscape was like in the past. So I definitely recommend using them. And the way that I recommend using them is through our tool called Atlascope. So uh, what this is, we digitally transformed over a hundred atlases of Boston and the surrounding areas from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The earliest map that we have up is 1861, and then the latest um, we have is 1938. They do go past 1938, but because of copyright laws, that's the most recent one that we can um, have up. Um, but I think that the most recent atlas that we have um, in our collection is 1963. 
Um, and you can definitely come see that in person when we're eventually in person again. Um, we just can't have it digitized. So basically, this in the back here is what our portal used to look like. It was just like a list of all of these pages of the atlas, um, which is kind of like a digital version of the same way that we were using them before, where you have to flip to a different page every time you want to see something else in the city. And what we've done is we've created, we've like basically stitched all of the pages together along the streets and um, layered them on top of each other in this tool. So this is like a cutout of most of Dorchester from 1884. Um, some areas have better coverage than others. Downtown Boston has like, I think two dozen um, atlases at the moment that cover it. Upham's Corner is covered by 11 atlases from 1874 to 1933. So I definitely recommend checking it out, um, atlascope.leventhalmap.org. And I'll leave that banner up at the bottom. Basically, the way that you use it, there are three options here. You can either click Find Me, um, and if you give it ac access to your um, to your GPS location, um, it will actually follow you around. So you can actually use this on your phone, and I definitely recommend trying that out. Um, and it'll follow you around the city, and you can see different layers um, through time. You can search places. Or you can start at BPL, which will start you at um, Central Library in Copley. We're going to search places, and I'm going to go to the Upham's Corner branch. Um, so I typed in 500 Columbia Road here. You have to make sure that you select the right one. Um, so like, there's a Columbia Road in a bunch of other towns around Boston, um, and you want to make sure that you choose the right one, especially like I was doing research on school streets recently. Um, for a trivia night that we had. And there are so many different school streets in the Boston area. And so you have to make sure that you're selecting the right one or you'll end up in a totally different part of town, which would be probably very interesting, but not what you're looking for. Um, and here it plops us down um, in Upham's Corner in 1874. It automatically goes to the oldest overlay map that we have and it automatically shows you a base map of modern streets. But you can change this. So um, if you click on that drop, drop up list, I guess, you can choose a different year. So I'm gonna choose 1933. And right there on the corner is the City of Boston Public Library Building. Um, there are a bunch of ways to look at it. Um, we were looking at the, the spyglass version before. But you can also swipe Y, which will show you in, like an up and down swipe, um, or swipe X here, which will go left to right. Um, and you can also play with the opacity of it so that you can kind of layer it and really see building footprints a lot better. So this one is a really good example, actually, at the library because you can see um, what is right on top of, of, um, of the map today. Um, oh, yeah, something that I definitely recommend doing is down here uh, underneath the overlay map, you can click about this map. Um, if you're looking for really specific information um, and you want to know like more about this atlas, you can click that. It'll give you all of the source information and it'll also allow you to do things like find this plate in digital collections, which means that then you can download it. So all of this, all of these atlases, you can actually download um, high resolution images of all of them. Um, a lot of these are at such high resolution that you can see the grain of the paper. Um, and you can download um, plate footprints, you can download like the geo reference versions that we have up here. So this is like what that will look like. It's just a uh, a big page from a book. Um, and incidentally, if you are um, interested in uh, winning a page like this from, from an atlas like this uh, that has been um, deaccessioned, 
you should come to our next trivia night on November 12th um, because this is what you will get as a prize. Not the whole book, but one spread. So um, let's try it out. So if everybody goes to atlascope.leventhalmap.org, um, I want to see, I want to make this kind of interactive. Um, check out what club used the building at 48 Pleasant Street in 1904. So you'll go to Atlas Scope, um, this address here, and then you're gonna click search places in the middle and type in 48 Pleasant Street. Make sure you select the right one um, in Dorchester. And then if you go down to the bottom right-hand corner and click, you can choose which map layer you're looking at. So if you want to put that in the comments, if you figure out which one it is, um, I'll give you a couple minutes, or maybe a minute. I think it's really fun. I mean, you'll see that there's no building there when you first plop into Atlascope, um, and then you have to go to a year where there is one. So I believe. 1904 is not the first year that the building is there. I think the first year that it appears on the map is 1894. And um, it actually has a different usage afterward. Um, so it's it's been a couple things over the years, like many old buildings in Boston. Um, and this one in particular has been a club building for a really long time. Um, and now it's actually a church. So um, it was the old Dorchester Club, um, which uh, there's a good picture of it here. It actually still looks pretty much the same. Um, the building is, um, I think, the Christ of the Rock Church today. Um, and for a while, it was the old Dorchester Club, and then it becomes the Columbus Club of the Knights of Columbus. Um, which it was, as you can see in this picture from Dorchester Athenaeum. And here it is in 1933 when it becomes the Columbus Club. There we go, Isaac got it uh, on, on YouTube, Old Dorchester Club, thank you. Um, so we're going to explore Athens Corner a little bit. Um, I've got, I've done a little bit of research. I'm definitely not an expert on the neighborhood, um, but I would say I'm very good at using this particular tool, um, having having helped build it and um, done a lot of staring at these atlases. So I just want to start at the library here um, and present a little bit of research that I actually did not personally do, but was done by some students at the Frederick Pilot School um, in Grove Hall. We were going to have a, a guest, a visitor coming from uh, the school tonight, but unfortunately, because the schools have gone remote, um, that wasn't possible. Um, but there's this really great book um, published by 826 Boston um, that is called We Hope You'll Visit. Um, it's got sections about multiple different parts of Dorchester, and um, I'm gonna look at the Upham's Corner part today. Um, definitely check out this link um, if you wanna buy the book. It's really cute, and it's um, very well researched, um, more importantly. So um, the students did research on two different parts of Dorchester, the Upham's Corner branch, of the Boston Public Library and the North Burying Ground. Um, so this young woman um, did a little bit of research on the Upham's Corner branch, um, opened in 1904. The children's room downstairs is in the pool area. Um, and uh, she talks about the fact that it's open six days a week, which unfortunately uh, not open in person right now. Um, there's a lot of research that she's done about um, the services that the library offers, which are maybe not historically important to us now, but will be in the future. So I think this is some really great research. 
Um, this other young woman did a bunch of research on it as well um, and mentions that um, it was a really busy commercial and residential area. Um, and that because the pool started leaking, that's why um, it became, it got uh, transformed into the children's uh, room instead of um, serving as a pool anymore. Um, some students also worked on um, researching the burying ground. Um, it's got a lot of like really rich information that I don't think I would have found anywhere else um, or it would have taken me a while to find it. Um, so this book is really great. Um, it talks, he talks about all of the uh, people who are buried in the burying ground. His favorite holiday is Halloween, which I thought was really great um, coming up this weekend. So happy holidays, Lens. Um, and this young man also um, researched the burying ground. Um, he talks about how it was open for the first time in 1634, um, which I believe makes it the like oldest Euro-American site um, in, in Boston that is still exists today. Boston um, was founded in 1630, but the oldest neighborhoods um, in downtown have been like basically completely destroyed um, because they were in places that were used for landfill. And here's a really great picture that I found from the 20s from the um, uh, Digital Commonwealth um, from the BPL photo collection. I think this is in the Abdelian collection. Um, I definitely recommend using Digital Commonwealth if you're doing this kind of research because you can see um, a lot of the buildings that you are looking at from above on the maps. You can also see um, like pictures of them and kind of bring them into three dimensions. Um, so here is, is the map version of the North Cemetery in 1874. Um, the, another thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, another little piece of research that I did was on um, the Blake House um, in Dorchester, which was built in 1661, um, which has been confirmed with uh, tree ring uh, chronology, gender chronology. Here, um, there, I've split this map between um, 1894 and 1898. On the left is 1894 and on the right is 1898. Um, and here we're zooming in. So you can see that right here um, at Edward Everett Square, this is a completely empty plot of land owned by the city of Boston in 1894. And then I slide across and in 1898, this building is suddenly there. Um, and you might think, oh, well, if it's built in 1661, shouldn't it have been there the whole time? It actually came from about 400 yards away um, to the Northwest. Um, this property was owned by Antonio Quinsler at the time. Um, and this is actually that same house in 1894. Oops. Um, and then it's gone in 1898. Um, I don't know why, if anybody knows why the footprint of the house is so different, um, I would be really happy to know. I'm sure it has something to do with the way that they restored it. Um, when they moved it in 96, um, I think that um, that's probably it. There were probably additions to it that were made. Um, that would be my guess. And then they took them off when they did the restoration. Um, I worked at the Paul Revere House for a couple of years. So uh, a lot of people would ask, it was built in 1680. And a lot of people would ask, is this the oldest house in Boston? And I would say, well, it's the oldest house downtown. Um, and now I finally know why that's what I had to say. It's because this is a, a, an older house by two decades. Um, but now I also understand why people were so surprised that it was in the same location that it had always been. This is actually the first major project where a house was moved, a historic house was moved to, um, to preserve it. Um, and then I did this little kind of deep dive last time I did this for um, the South End. I had done some research that um, people, <laughs> I didn't think people were going to be interested in where I did like a deep dive on um, kind of the history of a, one of the buildings that became a jazz club in, um, in the South End. And people were not 
uh, people were actually surprised that I didn't present that information. So I've done a kind of deep dive on a building um, in Upham's Corner to make up for that. And hopefully people find that interesting. Um, right here, I'm going to zoom in on it. But in the center of the picture here is the Hanley Private Hospital Nurses Home, or sorry, Harley Private Hospital Nurses, Nurses Home, right across the street from the hospital. Um, and I was kind of perusing Atlas Scope, looking for things to, um, to dig into. And this really struck me because one of the problems with um, these atlases is that they only show property owners' names, basically. It's very rare to find information um, about the people who actually lived in the houses, as I'm sure many of you know, especially if you live in Boston. Um, there are, like, renting is, is a really big part of, um, of living in Boston. Um, many people don't own their own homes, and that has been true throughout history. Um, and that makes it kind of frustrating for people, I think, when they're doing genealogy research, especially because you can't find out um, like who lived somewhere from these maps. You can only find out who owned the property. Um, but I took this as kind of an opportunity to dig deeper um, into who lived here. Um, so I used um, Ancestry. I definitely recommend um, while, while we're at home at the moment, um, I definitely recommend using BPL's um, kind of portal into Ancestry Library Edition. You have access to it from your house right now. Um, I'm not sure that will be true when we reopen, but at the moment you can go to um, the BPL's website and access um, all sorts of like really cool uh, resources that are usually only available from the library in person. Um, and one of them is Ancestry Library Edition. You can log in with your BPL uh, card. So that's what I did. Um, I found 17 Windermere Road, which maybe you can't see here, but that's the uh, address of this um, nurse's home. And I found all of these young women who are roomers in this house. Um, they're all female, they're all white, um, and they're all from the ages of like 18 to 24, and they're all single. Um, I thought that this was like, as you peruse Atlascope, you'll find a lot of kind of single gender housing. Um, and this is one that doesn't necessarily seem like it will be, but, but it is. Um, all of these young women are English speaking. Many of them are from Massachusetts. Some of them are from Canada as well. I know this is kind of hard to read. Um, and they're all pupil nurses. So here's, um, if you click at the bottom on Ancestry, you can always see um, like a text version of it um, that's been transcribed. Sometimes there are a lot of mistakes in it. So I definitely recommend looking at the handwriting if you can handle trying to decipher it. Um, but these are all basically uh, young women who are all living together and studying to be nurses. Um, so then I dug a little deeper. I wanted to know more about the, the building itself and what happened around that time. So this is the map that I showed you originally is from 1933. So I went to the city of Boston permit search. Um, I definitely recommend this if you're interested in like the history of buildings and the history of geographies. Um, and I found that in 1929, in December 1929, there was a fire at 17 Windermere um, on the third floor. You can see here that it is owned by Harley Hospital Corp. Um, there's structural damage. It's kind of hard to read um, the nature of the damage here, but basically the outside finish of the third floor was damaged um, and something about the second floor as well. And then several days later, two weeks later, there is um, this application to uh, work on the building, which I thought was really great. Um, it gives you information like it's got a pitch roof. Um, the building is wood, which we actually already knew because it's a yellow building on the map. Um, but it also tells you information that you wouldn't necessarily have known. Um, 
about about what happened, like giving you kind of a look into these nurses' lives, um, that there was a fire on the third floor. So you can definitely imagine like working backwards this way. If you have an ancestor that you're looking for, you can look at ancestry, find where they lived, look at it on Atlascope. So if you had done this for, for one of these nurses, if one of them were your ancestor, um, you would have done this, found where she lived, and then you could have found that she was um, a pupil nurse uh, at this specific hospital, which is something you might not have known about your ancestor beforehand. Um, so I am a huge fan of using all of these resources in conjunction together. Um, I actually dug a little deeper. I chose one specific nurse, um, just randomly, um, and I found that she was a, um, in 1940, she was still a nurse. She had graduated nursing school and she was working at the Winthrop Hospital. And I think she was actually living there as well because that's where she was listed um, on the census in 1940. So um, that's kind of all I have for um, my own presentation. But if people have places that they want to look up, um, I'm really happy to do that. So if you put in the comments like places that you're interested in or um, places that you want to uh, learn more about on Atlascope, um, I welcome you to put those in the chat. Um, we did get a comment um, that Upham's Corner used to be called Cemetery Corner because of the North Burying Ground. Um, which makes a lot of sense. Upham uh, was actually only there starting in, I think, 1804. Um, so it couldn't have been called Upham's Corner before someone named Upham lived there. Um, so it had a different name before that. So thank you, Isaac. Um, if anybody else has comments or questions, I would love to take those. Um, if you don't, that's fine too. I can just talk a little bit more about Atlascope. Um, it has definitely been a lot of work. We've done so many atlases. I feel like part of the reason that I'm able to give these talks is because I've stared at it for so long. Um, and I've spent a lot of time looking at these places. Um, let me pull up an atlascope window. Sorry, I gotta share my screen again. Sorry about all my tabs, please ignore them. Now that I've <laughs> drawn attention to them. Um, so Isaac wants me to look up Annapolis Street. which was not there prior to 1918. So you can see that uh, right away, that Annapolis Street is there now, was not there in 1874. So if we go back to 1910, we can see that that property was owned by a the heirs of Margaret A. Johnson. And then in 1918, suddenly there's a street there. So that's something that does happen quite often. Um, and that uh, there are also streets that used to be there and are not there anymore. So I do recommend like, while you're looking through Atlascope, you might find um, streets that, that did exist in the past and aren't there anymore, where you might have ancestors who lived on streets that existed in the past and are no longer there. Um, something that you will have to do in that case um, is try to find uh, like a city descriptor. Um, so I can't remember what these books are called, but they exist <laughs> on like Google Books. Um, I've used them a bunch of times where they describe like where street. And that has been very helpful to me because on Atlascope, you can't look up um, streets that don't exist anymore. You can only, like, the only streets that you can look at, the only addresses you can look at are addresses that still exist. Um, 
So even though they are in Atlas code, so like, um, I can't think of an example in Evans Corner, but there will be streets inevitably that um, that have been changed, that have changed their name, that have been built over, that have been um, kind of developed, and you won't be able to look those up, um, which is too bad. Um, and hopefully, we'll be able to change that functionality in the future um, if if that's possible. Um, but we. Um, we currently can't look up any addresses that don't exist anymore. Um, I got a request for the Strand Theater. Let me find that. Okay, so you can look it up, but I do know where it is. It's right here at up in the corner. Um, so that's actually a very good example. Thank you, Lonnie. Um, you won't be able to look it up because uh, it's not like a geo-coded place. Um, but we can find it on the maps. It's here in 1918 and in 1933. Um, but if you kind of scroll through the years, you can figure out what year something first existed. So. Um, in 1910, this is just someone's property, um, Martha Dyer. Another thing that I've learned through Alloscope is how many women own property. Um, in the 19th and 20th centuries, it's something that I definitely would not have thought was the case um, before. But spending so much time on Alloscope, there are so many women um, who are named as property owners. I don't know if they own the property outright or if it was kind of like a tax evasion um, plan from their husbands. Um, it could be either or both, um, but I have definitely, um, definitely learned a lot about the history of women's property ownership through, uh, through Atlascope and through these atlases. So the Open Corner Theater um, Company owned the Strand Theater they um it was built in georgia says 1918 or 1915. um so that's we know kind of like a date in um in archaeology we call it a terminus post clown a date after which so we know that it comes after 1910 um and before 1918. We have a request for the intersection of Mass Ave and Columbia Road. That's actually something um, that you can look up. Um, is like intersections. Um, so those are really good, um, like entry points into Atlas Scope. So the intersection of Mass Ave and Columbia Road. Um, was already kind of a crazy intersection by 1874. There are these like five streets coming together. I guess Boston Street is one street and Cottage Street is one street, but then there's um, Pond Street coming in here on in the Northeast. And we can compare it to today, um, which is also pretty crazy. Um, and back then they didn't have stoplights. So I can't imagine um, what things looked like back then. And then you can compare it to 1933 when it's become kind of, there's a square in the middle, um, Edward Everett Square. There are still like, now there are six entry points into the square, um, which seems like quite, uh, quite a lot um, in a time when there probably also still weren't uh, stoplights um, or, I don't, I don't even know when people started having stop signs, but I would imagine that this was a crazy intersection back then as well. Oh, we have a helpful comment that the grand opening of the Strand Theater was um, Armistice Day uh, 1918, which is, that's very patriotic of them. Um, so 
Yeah, so I really love using this tool. Oh, this is a really great map. You can really see the paper grain in 1933. Um, that's not true of all of these, but the 1933 map is, I guess, at particularly high resolution. Um, I, I really love looking at these. There's all this information that you would not be able to know otherwise, like the fact that Standard Oil had a building right here at the corner um, on Edward Everett Square. Um, there are a lot of schools um, in Upham's Corner and a lot of churches. I find that churches are a really useful way of um, looking at the histories of neighborhoods. So um, there's this Roman Catholic church here in 1933. I'd be interested to see um, what it is before that. So it was still, it was already a Roman Catholic church in 1904. In 1894, this property is completely undeveloped. Um, so it's been divided up into these um, kind of parcels. These are each um, square footage, I believe, of the parcels. So these numbers, in some places in Boston, the parcels are much smaller and they're um, still four digit numbers, but they're usually like 19 something or 2000 something, which is very confusing. I think a lot of people are like, is that a year? That doesn't make any sense because it's from like 1920. Why would it have 1974 on it? Though so they're um, square footage of the parcels. So St. Margaret's has been a, a Roman Catholic church for its entire history, which I think can tell you um, a lot about the neighborhood and about who lives there. Um, because they wouldn't have built a Catholic church there if there wasn't a large Catholic population in the neighborhood. Um, so I think that tells you a lot about it. There is this street here that's St. Margaret. So I guess, let's see. It was not, ooh, this is pretty interesting because Georgia also asked me a question. This is called Orchard Place before it becomes um, St. Margaret's Street. So. Um, Upham's Corner had a lot of orchards, um, Georgia pointed out, before it became super developed. And it's interesting that there is this street here that's called Orchard Place. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there were actual orchards there on this property that used to belong to the heirs of Richard Clapp, um, after whom Clapp Street is clearly named. Um, but yeah. Um, so we have this question from Isaac. Why so many years in between available atlases? Are there other atlases available for the years in between? That's a really good question. So I would say there are like a couple layers of answers to that. Um, they didn't publish an atlas every year. Um, well, not everybody published an atlas every year. There probably are some companies that published more atlases than what we have available. Um, we don't have like a comprehensive um, collection of them, but something that happened really often, I wonder if I can find an example of this, is um, something called paste-ons. So they would, um, let's say they published an atlas in 1898 and um, not a lot had changed between 1898 and 1899. But in the process, like in between when they created the Atlas and when it was published or the next year after it was published, they had um, like a school took over um, a property or something like that. The Atlas companies would actually send out little like basically stickers that you would paste onto your own copy of the Atlas to fix it. So if there were things that changed over time, um, they wouldn't necessarily publish a whole new set of atlases for those changes, those minor changes. Instead, you would actually fix your own copy so that it was up to date. Um, I wonder if I can find, I don't know if I can find um, a, an example of that in Upham's Corner. There are definitely examples of it in other parts of Boston. Um, these atlases have like uh, a lot, a lot of depth to them, including literal depth to the page. So like there are places where there are stickers on the page um, where things have changed. 
Um, there are places where um, people have like crossed out certain things and replaced and like written in the new information. Um, so there's like a lot of history, not even just what was published, but what was added afterwards. Um, I would say that you can look at other collections as well um, to pull a kind of like miracle on 34th Street, um, check out gimbals kind of thing. Um, you can check out, um, we, we definitely have the like most comprehensive collection of these Boston analysis that I know of, but I'm sure that other people have years that we don't have. Um, and you could definitely look for those. Um, Library of Congress would probably be a good place to start, I would say. Um, but yeah, the and the Massachusetts State Library, we're hoping to be able to um, add more atlases to this. But for the moment, like this is all of the ones that we had that were available. So thank you for that question. Cool. Well, if nobody has any more questions, um, we definitely can wrap it up. Um, I do want to say before we like totally end, there's this feedback link um, that I would love for people to uh, to type in and give us feedback on um, how you felt about this program, um, what you think we could do better. Um, it's kind of a, a mouthful, this, um, but I made it a lot shorter than it was, I promise, this little um, URL. Um, and um, I will also post, let me stop sharing and reshare my PowerPoint because I also want you guys to have access to the, um, to the link to the slideshow. I will say um, the problem with Bitly is that it's hard to tell the difference between a lowercase l and a capital I. I checked for you guys, this is a capital I. So <laughs> three lowercase m is C, capital I, T, one D. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll try to do descriptive links in the future, um, but this is what we have for the moment. So fill out our feedback form. If you have time, it should only take a couple minutes. Um, let me know if you have any more questions. Oh, we did get sneaking in at the end. Um, who would buy these atlases and what would they be used for? So that's a really good question. Um, I don't know that they were like, so I don't actually know, I don't have a good answer to this question. I'm sure that somebody does, um, but it's not me. But I do know who they, what they would be used for. Um, most of the atlases that we have are Bromleys or like a large portion of them are Bromleys. They were published by um, GW Bromley. Uh, and he published um, real estate atlases. So anyone who is interested in kind of property development, stuff like that would, would want a copy of this atlas. Um, a lot of them are also fire insurance atlases, as I mentioned at like the very top, um, which means that they were used to decide like what property um, should be insured for. So like if properties were like super, fire safe, then your insurance would be low. And if like you have a boiler and a furnace and no night watchman and no windows and your building is brick or your building is wood, um, it's probably gonna cost a lot to insure your building. So um, that is the kind of information that would be like really, um, really important to people at the time. Um, now, as you can tell, like, they're just really useful for research um, and really interesting for people who are trying to do types of like genealogy research, property research, um, local history. Um, they're, they're really just like very full of information. If you guys are interested, um, there's a really great, um, there's a really great thing that, that I've been uh, working on, which is a candy tour of Boston. It'll go up as a blog um, on BPL blogs this week, but um, I've also been releasing it in little pieces um, on our social media. And a lot of that is research that I did using Atlascope, um, kind of like 
staring at these plates for hours on end, I noticed so many like candy factories. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you, that really like pops out at you when you've been staring at this forever. Um, so you're definitely gonna, if you spend some time just like scrolling through Atlas Scope when you're supposed to be working, um, you're definitely gonna find a lot of things that, that are super interesting and that are um, probably applicable to the neighborhood where you live. Um, and then we have this great question, which is, are we hiring or accepting volunteers? At the moment, we're not, we're not hiring and we um, are kind of putting our volunteer program on pause. When we're in person, we definitely um, love to have volunteers. We have like uh, a really great group of people who work um, with us. Um, and uh, so we'd be happy to have you, assuming, uh, assuming we can open at some point in the near future um, and you're still interested. Um, but in the meantime, for your local land and property research, um, definitely hit us up. Um, if you go to our website, which is reventhalmap.org, I'll put it um, in the chat. Um, you can click on uh, the research um, kind of tab at the top. Um, we're going to have a brand new website rolling out soon, but at the moment, there's a little tab at the top that says research. Um, and you can um, kind of fill out a forum, tell us what you're interested in. And we have reference librarians who are still working full time, even though we're not in person. So um, we have a GIS librarian who would be super happy to help you with like um, any of your like data information that you're looking for. Um, and we have a, a reference librarian who can help you with historic questions. Um, she is like an expert on our collection. She knows a lot more than I do, and she would be able to answer a lot of these questions that people are asking. Um, and uh, they'd be very happy to talk to you about it. Um, they um, they can probably work, you know, um, with you uh, over Zoom. If you're asking, <laughs> probably um, if you talk to them we can work something out. Um, definitely send us an email or drop us a line in the um, in the research uh, questions portal and um, we'd be happy to talk. Um, I'm sure that Isaac, you're not the only person who's interested in doing these research um, questions, so I'm really glad that you're asking. Um, and it would be uh, really fun to work with you. So anybody who has like, genealogy questions, data questions, anything remotely geography based, we're here to help. We can help you make maps. Um, we can help you um, learn more about maps that already exist. Um, and our current exhibition, Bending Lines, is really all about um, looking at data, um, trying to figure out where it comes from and how maps work. Um, and like what kind of information they're showing and what kind of information they're hiding. So um, if you definitely check that out, um, I think you'll get a kick out of that. Um, I'm gonna bring Georgia back in just to say goodbye. Is that okay, Georgia? <laughs> hey. Hi, so um, I wanna thank Rachel for this. I hope that you guys all enjoyed it as much as I did. And I want to bring it into the future as well and remind you guys that Upham's Corner, although it seems like it's been on pause for a really long time, is in the process of going through a major re-looking at who we are and who owns land and how we build and all of those things with the arts innovation um, center that we are becoming that is restarting again and there should be a public program about it in the end of November so keep in touch with the library keep in touch with if you have people that you know who are members of the WAG um, workers working advisory group for that process then hopefully you no, stay involved. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the message is stay involved, stay involved with the Upham's Corner branch, stay involved with us. We would love to hear from you, like no matter what 
your question is. Um, we would love to try to help. Um, and yeah, fill out that feedback form. Hold on, I'll, I will. I will type it in for everybody so that people click on the link. Um, but yeah, uh, Georgia, you said that you don't have any uh, programs coming up. That was the other thing I wanted to say. Currently, we don't have any programs planned for the rest of the fall. We do have something that's in the works for in the winter, but I don't have dates for it yet. Um, but you guys are our audience. So if there are things that you are looking for, more programs like this, things that are music, things or whatever, let us know. Um, I was having trouble putting things in the comments, which is why I was sending things to the private chat with Rachel. But the email at the library is upums at bpl.org. So we are absolutely here for you guys. Yeah, and us too. Um, we would love to know if you if you like this program. If you hated this program, please also let us know, although you've probably left by now. Um, and um, we'll be doing a similar one next week for Fields Corner, um, just a week from today on uh, November 4th, um, also at 7 p.m. So um, check out uh, Eventbrite or the BPL events calendar if you are interested in that. Um, and we'd love to see you again. So thank you so much, Georgia, for having me. No problem. Thank you for doing it. And we'll say goodnight. Good Bye, everybody.